Hello and welcome to No Filter, a Nintendo podcast. I'm your host, Wizrad, and this is episode 12, being recorded on February 23rd, 2018. And holy crap, this year has been just flying by. And this is seriously the quickest I've ever experienced at the start of a new year. Uh, I can't believe we're almost into March, everybody, but hope you guys are all doing well. I've been doing a little bit better, I've been super swamped with just work and stuff like that, so haven't been as active with uh, videos and stuff like that, but I have been trying to somewhat consistently do this podcast every week, so uh, hope you guys are enjoying that. Um, but yeah, we have a ton of stuff to talk about today, so let's get right into it here, guys, with some of the news. So first off, we have the Dice Award. So this, uh, I believe this was last night um, on the 22nd. Uh, I could be wrong. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, know I don't usually pay attention to anything this far into 2018 for the past year. But uh, yeah, apparently Dice Awards was out there. And good God, <laughs> the host, Jessica Chobot, I remember her from IGN back in the day, and Greg Miller, it was fucking atrocious. I mean, their jokes were awful, like, it was so fucking scripted, and I already can't stand Greg Miller for a multitude of reasons, but, uh, just, it was so fucking cringy, and they, they would needlessly swear, they would throw different things in there, their jokes weren't good, it was just so garbage, <laughs> um, but I'll give them one thing, Greg Miller did coin the phrase, the Nintendo guy, for Nate Bildorf, who was the Nintendo of America representative there to basically collect all the awards that he was getting, uh, it was pretty hilarious, there's a lot of funny memes coming out about it later, and, um, but yeah, so Nintendo, I believe, won around nine awards in the, I believe that was almost half of the awards they gave, um, it's pretty crazy. Four or five of them, I believe, were the ones that he had actually had to go up on stage to collect. I think four of the other ones were the ones that they just... Um, I think they actually did well here, better than the Video Game Awards, where they just kind of announced all the nominees, and then they went right into the winner, and then they didn't have people go up onto the stage. So it was games like... Um, uh, Fire Emblem Heroes, handheld game, Metroid Samus Returns, um, I believe Racing Game was one of those as well. You know, it was a lot of those type of things that they just kind of threw in there and made go quickly by. I, I still want to have a longer video about who's selecting these um, categories because it's fucking ridiculous that platforming is not a category here. The fact that Super Mario Odyssey, one of the best rated games of all time, one of the best games probably of all time, or at least one of the best 3D platformers of all time, is only uh, delegated to one sound design win. Um, I understand it's mainly because Zelda is there, but that is fucking ridiculous. Platforming is one of the main genres of gaming. And this year had games like Hat in Time, Ukulele, Super Mario Odyssey, and I'm sure a lot of other games that could be included in that category. And yet they put all these other categories in there instead of that. I don't know. That was a little bit, you know, the same thing happened with the Video Game Awards. And I feel like I want to do a nice long tweet at WizRat if you guys want to follow me. I want to do like a nice long tweet uh, talking to Jeff Keighley, Dice Awards, Video Game Awards, whatever, because this can't happen again, man. Like, all these games aren't getting recognition that they deserve. Platformers are basically, like, they're like the base of all games that are out right now. Shooters have a lot of elements from platformers. You know, all third-person shooters basically are platformers included in with it. You know what I mean? You need just a straight platforming category because it's always here. Odyssey is one of the best games of the year, and it's still only relegated to one sound design win which in my opinion I think should have still went to Zelda Breath of the Wild, the sound design in that game, the whole game's based around the sound design, you know, with the wild and, yeah, you know, you're going through the grass, you hear different things, it changes when you come up to a situation, you know, I don't know. Either way, I'm super happy for Nintendo. It was hilarious just to see Nate Bildorf, though, go out there. The really cool guy, by the way. I always liked him in the Treehouse stuff. I believe he wrote for Nintendo Power. Um, but his speeches, they were short. They were concise. They, um, they, they were specific to those categories. They were really well done. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I was super impressed with that. The, the guy did a fantastic job, and it was just funny, you know, seeing him. They always have the camera to him, and he's at like the back end of the table there. He's like running up to the stage because he doesn't want to waste people's time going up to the stage for the fifth time in a row. Um, but yeah, Zelda did win Game of the Year, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, and best game direction, best game design, all that, all that good stuff, which I think is totally deserved. Um, but one thing that is kind of another piss off, even this awards put PUBG in the best game of the year category. And they put that in over Persona 5 and Near Automata. 
They put it in over Cup. I mean, they put Cuphead in instead of Persona 5 and Nier Automata. I'm not saying Cuphead's bad. I'm saying PUBG is kind of bad. Um, I, I get that it's revolutionary in its multiplayer aspect, and this is going to be something that carries forward for the next few years at least, but the game is not nearly there, and that's basically an insult to development, uh, the development teams of Persona 5 and Nier Automata. You know, the, the fact that you're putting in this broken-ass game like PUBG that's basic, one map, all this kind of stuff, very little... Uh, um, detail, attention to detail, all that kind of stuff, and you're putting that in above Persona 5 in your Automata, that is absolutely ridiculous. Um, anyway, let's move on from this. I'm already taking a lot of time this podcast. Uh, Doom and Rocket League have both received patches. So this is cool because it's from Panic Button. Uh, you know, they're improving resolution and their performance, and both were actually kind of significant. You know, I noticed quite a bit of a change with Rocket League uh, when that update came out. I haven't tried out Doom yet, but just seeing from comparisons and stuff like that, it seems pretty noticeable as well. It's really cool to see. Um, And I kind of hope this is just growing pains with Panic Button because everyone's, you know, kind of on their... You know, on their um, on their deck right now, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to call it. But every everyone's uh, you know brown nosing uh, panic button right now. Uh, you know, I hear a lot of developers are trying to go over to them and get their games ported to the Switch and using them. Um, but I'm just hoping that this is just growing pains with them learning the Switch because uh, Wolfenstein 2, when that comes out, it better not have these same issues that they have to patch later on. You know, these games should be complete, should be working to the utmost potential of the Switch, everything from day one. We should not have to wait three months or four months or whatever it is later to get patches for this because not not only is that just terrible for the buyers, it's a horrible thing to do to people. But it also means that um, it encourages people to wait and buy the games on sale later on and not new. And that's what I've been learning with a lot of these games that are coming out like this. And uh, and now that I have a PS4, I'm kind of learning the same thing. It's it's really kind of frustrating to see that. And uh, you know, they deserve props for sticking with these games even all the months down the line. But they need to get it right. So from now on, if they're having issues with this stuff. I'm going to be pissed, <laughs> you know, like if Doom was just released how it was and that was the best they could get, then I was fine with that. But now that they have a patch later on, it means that it wasn't up to its best that they could have done. So again, I don't want to just tread too long, but that's, that's my thoughts on that. Um, uh, one other thing I did want to bring up, though, was Rhyme got a patch. Uh, so this was kind of surprising to me because I remember after the game came out, uh, it seemed kind of silent from I believe it's Tequila Works who worked on Rhyme. Um but this is definitely a too late of a case here because as far as Doom and Rocket League went, the games were still great. They ran well and everything was, you know, they're perfectly playable and great games. Whereas Rhyme with the issues it was having when it first came out on Switch uh, apparently was very almost unplayable with how how much lag it would have, how much, you know, all the frame drops were insane and, uh, you know, resolution, all that kind of stuff. I think this is a little bit too late. It's cool to see that they did stick with it. Apparently, it did fix quite a lot of the issues. There are still some, but there's some some in pretty much every version of the game. Um, But yeah, again, Rhyme wasn't that fantastic game to play right from the get-go. So now I'm going to be waiting on either a huge sale or because I do want to play it just handheld. This is a game that I'd want to be able to play just on handheld. But if not, I do believe I have access to it with GameShare on my PS4, so I could probably just play it for free there. I believe it might have been on a PlayStation Plus or something like that or something like that. Um, yeah, next bit, uh, Mega Man Legacy Collection uh, 2 and 1, whatever it is. But uh, basically, yeah, the, you guys know uh, the first came out on 3DS. That's the one I bought. I played through Mega Man's 1 through 3. Then I got kind of burnt out and bored with it. I feel like the quality of the Mega Man games, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, people, but I believe after the second one or maybe the third one, the quality kind of dipped on the Mega Man games because 4 through 6, I tried starting up each one. You could tell some of it was like, laggy weird it didn't feel as good in control wise and uh yeah it just wasn't very interesting to me maybe i was just burnt out but i don't think i'm gonna be going back to that one anyway so i won't be getting these games but uh one thing that is annoying is uh, mega man mega man legacy collection 2 is coming out as well which is really cool at least it is coming out but they are coming out uh, physically in a dual pack however only one game will be on a cartridge these remakes these 
whatever it is, emulations of old Mega Man games. So apparently Legacy Collection 1 with all the music and everything you collect, it was like 380 something megabytes. And Mega Man Legacy Collection 2 was apparently 6 gigabytes. So Capcom not knowing how to fucking optimize anything. Um, this is insane. So Legacy Collection 2 will not be on the cartridge. Just one. What the fuck is up with this? I can't stand this. The one game I did buy that used this was Resident Evil Revelations Collection because I wanted to play 2 and I wanted to have it physical. I don't want to buy any more of these games that come out like this. You know, if it's one game and that game comes out and it needs to have additional add-on because the Switch cartridge is only 8 gigabytes of the user, whatever it is, that's fine. I'm fine with that, whatever. However... If they're actually doing this, they're actually making the game so that one game is completely downloadable when you buy it in a dual pack like this, that is fucking trash, especially when it's games like this where they could easily fit on an 8 gigabyte Switch card. What the actual fuck? Um, I don't know if maybe this is uh, an issue with Nintendo. Is this some kind of rule with Nintendo? Is you know, Or maybe it's something with Capcom, how if they're doing a dual pack, they don't want to have to... Or, you know, is it something about separating the games? You can't put them both on one cart because they are set two separate games in the ecosystem or something like that. And they, maybe they'd have to go to ESRB something separate if they're together in the same cart. I don't know what it is, but get your shit together. To be Again, to be fair, I wasn't going to buy this game anyway, but now I'm definitely not buying this game. It's Capcom. I fucking Capcom is a great developer. I love Capcom. They have some really imaginative, great games, but they fuck up so much. Just business-wise and just just so many things they just fuck up. It's ridiculous and it's infuriating. But anyway, last bit of news. The Spyro Trilogy has been rumored. So uh, apparently this will be for PS4 with the one-year exclusivity, much like the Crash Insane Trilogy. Um, I've never really gotten into the Spyro games. I do remember when I was a little bit younger, I did rent back, you know, back when you could go to your Blockbuster or Rogers video for me. Um you know, the stores and rent a game. I believe I rented one of the older uh, Spyro games and I did really enjoy it. I like those 3D platformers like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I returned it. I kind of forgot about it and I just never really got back into the games. Um, I've always kind of known that they, they have a, not really even like a cult following, I'd say, but you know, they do have their audience there. A lot of these uh, bigger mascot uh, platformers usually did. And um, I would love to see a trilogy on the Switch. Apparently those are rumors out there as well. So, you know, I'm not going to be buying these games on my PS4 or anything like that. It, a lot of these games like this, man, if I can get them, I want them on the Switch. The portability is really a game breaker for me. Um, I just can't think about buying this game on a PS4. I just can't do it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I also haven't got Crash Insane Trilogy. Because apparently that's supposed to be coming out for the Switch as well very soon. Apparently, again, I guess Sony has a one-year exclusivity deal with Activision uh, for these games. So if Crash Insane Trilogy comes out, I think I will be picking that up for the Switch. So again, the portability does really... Uh, I've been spoiled. <laughs> so uh, yeah, next on to the games I've been playing. So I kind of want to go through these a little bit quickly. Um, I do have uh, a Hot Matches coming up, another segment of that, and a No Filter Rant as well in the same episode, so a lot of stuff to go over. But uh, yeah, let's get into the games I've been playing. Gravity Rush Remastered. So uh, I got this game on PS4. Um, I got this in the holiday sale when I also used my 20% off uh, as well as uh, PlayStation Plus, so I got a significant uh, discount on uh, this game as well. Uh, I did have it on PS Vita, and it was one of my favorite games on the Vita. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not as good as I remember. Um, you know, uh, as I remember when it was on the Vita, I still did enjoy it for the most part. But it, you know, it felt like a little bit of a chore after a while. A lot of the missions were. You know, collect this, go here, you know, escort this guy, but escorting isn't really that great. The combat wasn't exactly as I remember it either. Maybe maybe I was just a little bit lax on it because it was a, uh, a Vita game. But um, either way, I did enjoy it still. Um, I enjoy the look. I love the premise, the gravity mechanic in general. I just absolutely love it. You know, moving around the 3D space like that was so unique to me at the time that uh you know that one might maybe clouded my judgment a little bit but 
Either way, I'm really excited to see the improvements that it uh, that it makes in the sequel. I already have that uh, waiting underneath uh, my TV over there right now, so that'll be one of the next games I play on my PS4. Um, you know, I've been I'm I'm still kind of annoyed that it didn't come out for the Vita as well, but hopefully uh, with I guess the additional horsepower and everything like that, and they they improved on a lot of the gameplay elements too, because uh, yeah, I'm really excited and I do really enjoy this uh, uh, these games so. Uh, yeah, so that's one of the games I completed on uh, PS4. Next, I wanted to talk about, just I guess sort of briefly again, is uh, Elder Scrolls Skyrim. Uh, so again, I'm playing this game on the Switch, and uh, it runs like perfectly, I guess. Like, uh, Unless you call the glitches and stuff just on Switch, I doubt it. I feel like that's the thing with all the, all the versions. Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a really phenomenal open world game. Um, again, where I kind of talked about it last... Uh, uh, last week, this game focuses more on, I guess, the social aspects throughout the game, and that's what makes it really more open. Um, the actual world itself, I don't think, is actually crafted that well. Um, a lot of the design isn't there. It's really just kind of... I get that it's a dreary landscape, and that's kind of what they're going for, but man, it's just... When I go through this game, I just wish they, they'd have a little bit of a change in the landscapes. You know what I mean? It's so much of the same kind of done over and over like again i don't want to sound so down on it like that but i think i might have just been spoiled too much with zelda and how they designed the world um it just seems like this is kind of thrown together to fill up a large world that they can make whereas zelda it seemed like everything was meticulously like kind of designed i don't know i feel like zelda kind of ruined a little bit the open world for skyrim for me um because it's just not nearly as good <laughs> as far as that as far as that's concerned but uh as far as everything else goes i the music is really cool i love the whole shout aspect to it i'm going through all of that i i just you know uh went through the ga- uh, gray beards and everything like that i've been going through the story a little bit slow i've been going through all these side quests and right now i'm just kind of swooping around the entire map and going to all the major cities and uh collecting all these side quests and you know i I love these collection type games like that too so having a lot of that is really cool you know finding these monuments increases my carrying capacity i love that um and uh yeah and 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 you know all these side missions are really interesting and I, i feel like this is something that zelda could definitely have learned from skyrim where zelda did have some that were really interesting not all of them were like that where almost every uh, side quest you can think of in Skyrim it all has a certain location that that's uh, that's um, referring to and that has like basically a separate little mission inside a cave or at like a hut or something like that all of its own and it usually has a story that goes along with it or for the most part and everything is somewhat interesting like that so you know I just went through this one uh, level which is like in an underground under cave grotto with uh, you know like a swampy water thing and like a shipwrecked uh, ships there with some like bandits and a whole bunch of bandits and their leaders and stuff like that and like that was such a cool like time there that I decided that mission I'm going to go all in stealth and uh, you know I was like picking off people with sneak attacks with my bow you know I ended up clearing out a few of the guys avoiding some others going into the main uh, headquarters ship or whatever it is and basically like assassinating the guy while he was sleeping uh, you know, and then basically decapitating the guy. I actually put it on my uh, Twitter if you guys want to see the video of that. You know, that was super satisfying. And they have a lot of these moments here where this isn't even part of the main story. This is a side quest that is really intriguing and really cool. And uh, and yeah, like, you know, that's where Skyrim really shines. And that's why I think so many people have an affinity for this, uh, for this game. And I imagine the series. This is my first Elder Scrolls game, guys. So, um, yeah, like... Uh, the combat's really cool. I, I do like how it is. It's a lot of just kind of like rock, paper, scissors, cat and mouse, like back away, hit them, back away, hit them. But, you know, you do have all the di- different kind of spells you can use or your shouts you can use. You know, you can use one-handed weapons, two-handed weapons. You can uh, sneak and do it all stealth-like. You can use uh, bows, which is really cool. Probably my favorite uh, uh, element to the game. Um, you know, all the dragons that show up randomly throughout the level is really cool. And... uh and yeah, yeah, I'm still gonna play through it, you man. Like I'm still like addicted. I'm still playing it for multiple hours every day. So, uh, you know, I've been getting less sleep because of this game as well. <laughs> so many of these big games I'm playing. Um, and yeah, you know, like I'm really, really enjoying it. So uh, I might do a, a longer review after I finish the game, going into more of the details of what I think and uh, comparing it, I guess, to other games uh, that are similar to it. 
but yeah, I'm definitely really enjoying it, and uh, I highly suggest it. Uh, I guess one thing I do want to say, again, if this was just on the PS4, I would not want to get it. I think I've been spoiled too much with the portability of the Switch. If this wasn't on a portable system, I would not want to be playing this game. Um, I don't know, it's just the portability makes it so much better. Anyway, uh, next game. Uh, I picked up, uh, actually, these next games I haven't actually played yet, but uh, there's a few that I uh, uh, picked up and purchased. Um, I picked up uh, Radiant Historia, Perfect Chronology. Uh, so, as you guys might know from uh, my past channel, that kind of stuff, um, Radiant Historia was my favorite RPG on the DS, one of my favorite games, uh, well, one of my favorite RPGs ever, and uh, yeah, I was 100% going to be getting this game, not just for support, but because I do want to play through it again, and uh, and not to mention I could get this uh, launch edition with the art book and sticker sets and all that kind of stuff, mainly the art book. Um, I'm not sure exactly when I can start this game, you know, after I finish Skyrim, I, I'm probably going to take a break from all these longer RPGs, I've been just uh, too many really long games I've been playing recently, I gotta get into some of the smaller ones, so maybe soon after that, we'll see, but uh, yeah, I'm really excited for Rating Historia Perfect Chronology on the 3DS, so um, that's actually the second last game I'm going to be getting on the uh on the 3ds uh with detective pikachu coming in on amazon i've been hearing a lot of negatives from people seeing the trailers i didn't expect much in as far as design of the humans but everything else looks really interesting i love the professor lane and phoenix wright game so i'm hoping this captures something kind of like that and uh yeah that's i think that's going to be my last 3ds game i buy that's i guess new coming out because i do have to take a look at ever oasis and fire emblem shadows echoes uh, of valentia so anyway uh, next games, I just want to say that I uh, did buy them or pre-purchase them, but you know I haven't really got to them yet. Um, I pre-purchased Mulaka, which uh, looks to be one of the best indie games coming out for the Switch. Uh, this was my most anticipated indie game from one of the past indies, indies directs. I forget the exact one, but uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, what happened to the Morphe's game? Morphe's Law? Um, don't know what happened with that. It seemed to just fall off. I thought it was coming out in 2017. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, Mulaka looks fantastic. It's like this Mexican um, kind of design to it, I guess, and uh, it looks really cool with these open landscapes. And I just want to see how open world this game actually is from an indie team. It looks really, really like striking. So I highly suggest you guys check that out because I just pre-purchased it. I haven't even seen full gameplay trailers of it. I, I was completely sold from day one on that. So um, I'm excited for that. Uh, I picked up Faye. Haven't got the chance to play it yet because of Skyrim, but I, I feel like I might pick it up soon to give myself a little bit of break from the Skyrim uh, and get into some more of this, it seemed like more stealthy platforming kind of thing. Uh, really beautiful art style, so I'm really looking forward to getting into that. And um, the last game that I picked up, or it was really more of an update, a free update for Slime Sun, uh, the Blackbird's Kraken DLC. Um, I'm excited to play, but you know, I feel... Um, People really need to give this game a look. I believe it's on sale right now on the eShop, so I highly, highly suggest everyone takes a look at this. If you liked games like um, Super Meat Boy or even Celeste that recently came out, this is a game for you. Seriously, uh, it, it's it's really good. Tons of levels, and this new uh, update is 25 brand new levels with new, with new modes, new uh, costumes from other indie developers, stuff like that. I'm really excited to play through this because I love Slime Sun. That was one of the best indie games of 2017. So, really cool to see. So this next segment is a little segment I like to call Hot Matches, where I talk about any video game related topic I just wanted to bring up and give you guys my thoughts on. So, this, uh, this segment I want to talk about re-releasing old games on the Switch. So... We see with the Switch uh, right now, it seems like not just with ports uh, from Nintendo or anything like that, we see a ton of games being re-released on the Switch from either Steam or mobile or even console ports from PS4 and Xbox One. Um, is this cashing in? People just trying to get a buck? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, nothing inherently wrong with that, but I do feel like it is very unhealthy for the system. And, uh, you know, I hope people start to support more new games coming to the system rather than old games re-released again. Um, one of the things I did want to talk about here, and I think one of the things that really outlined my point is games like Rocket League, Minecraft, Enter the Gungeon, Stardew Valley, Overcooked, 
etc etc these games we've seen on the top 15 charts for best sellers on the switch for months these games have been re-released on many platforms before and these are not new experiences for the switch you know there these are just some of the few that are there there's so many others that are released from mobile and steam and all that kind of stuff that have been on the charts and uh or, or just some that aren't even on the charts, but they are still being released and clogging up other releases on the Switch. And I don't think this is healthy at all. Um, how, how I see it here is that because a lot of these games have grown um, cult fame, or not even cult fame, you know, or have just grown fame in the video game industry, I understand why they do so well. You know, an established series like Minecraft, everyone knows what they're getting when they're going into it. There's no surprises for them. They know what they're buying into, plus it's on a portable system now, even though, you know, it's been on other portable systems, but, you know, but plus it's on a portable system like this, people are going to buy it, and I understand why that's big. Same with games like Rocket League, you know, and all these games I just listed here. I I understand why they are selling, but I don't think that's healthy for the system in general, because the more that these ports, uh, not ports, but these re-releases of old games sell, the more of those we're only going to see. We might not be seeing the vast amount of new experiences coming to the Switch that we should be seeing, you know? Um, whether it be that those uh, those experiences are just kind of hidden behind all these re-releases coming out that people have more um, knowledge of, you know, that the video game sites are going to report more on because it's a well-known um, IP that everyone can kind of is aware of and people want to read into, you know, that's what my issue is here. And, it, you know, and it freaks me out, you know? Same thing can be said with the ports uh, from consoles. You know, games like Doom, Wolfenstein 2, um, Dark Souls, L.A. Noir, Skyrim. You know, a lot of these games, they're all well-known already. You know, uh, game IPs, all that kind of stuff. Games have been out for, in some cases, many, many years on other systems. And if they come out to the Switch and this is what gets all the attention, what about the new games that are coming out? And if there are no no, no new games coming out, that's fine. But is this deterring other developers from saying, hey, we need need to put the money and effort into a new game on this thing? Or are they saying, hey, hey, why don't we just port all of our games that we released the year before on the other system and just bring them to Switch? You know, they'll sell their Nintendo, right? Hmm. But then we're going to see that those games don't sell nearly as well because they're fucking three years old or whatever, or a year old. And then they don't run as well, you know? Portability for a lot of these games is a huge driving factor for me, but it won't be for everybody. And I don't think when all these games are being released so much later than on other systems that it's really going to drive as much sales as either they're hoping or maybe they're not hoping and they just want a scapegoat to say, hey, we're not going to support Nintendo. But it's it's super infuriating to see that these games get so much of the attention, whereas new games that come out don't seem to be getting that. And, uh, you know, and, and it kind of worries me. You know, um, recently, at least with 2018, we haven't been seeing, uh, we still don't know of a lot of any new games really coming out. We, we know of stuff that's coming out in the future. We don't have any dates for them, but we also don't see what actually is coming out from third parties. You know, we have what was already announced, like that Star Atlas thing or whatever it is and a few other things. But, you know, we don't have too many of these uh, brand new experiences that we see here. People love to say that the Wii U was selling incredibly uh, you know incredibly poorly it had the worst third party support ever but did it i i seem to remember the first year of the wii u i didn't have a wii u though but the first year of the wii u it got games like mass effect it got games like deus ex it got assassin's creed i believe day and date with the other systems assassin's creed 3 assassin's creed 4 uh rainbow six um blacklist which is a phenomenal game by the way um it, it had a ton of third party games coming out for it and not all of them were very old but yeah yeah a lot of them were (laughs) but uh you know when i'm seeing that and then i'm seeing games coming out here it just has it just makes me worry you know i'm not seeing the new games coming out much like it didn't happen with the wii u and then they drop their support you know they're saying hey you know what rainbow six only sold uh 80 copies on the switch whereas it sold uh you know 500 copies on the ps4 or sorry, PS3 and Xbox or whatever it is, you know, 
the, these guys use these things. They release a game months later, and then this is the issue here after the fact, where it doesn't sell as well on the system, that doesn't play it as well, is missing content, and was sold a year after the other versions. You know what I mean? So this this has me worried here. Um, just in similar vein to that, but in this case, just releasing ports on the system. We should be desiring and pushing for new game experiences. And the more that these games overshadow the new games that come out, the less developers are really going to be interested in supporting the Switch in that way. So that is a big concern for me. Um, and again, I get that many of these games are the first time coming to the console from Steam, mobile, you know, uh, Xbox One, PS4, whatever. But like, come on, <laughs> you know, we need the new experiences. And uh, and that's really all I want to talk about this uh, this week, guys. I do have some more stuff I could, could go on to the subject, but I wanted to kind of briefly go over this and say, hey, this is something of a concern here. I don't like that it's constantly Rocket League and uh, Stardew Valley at the top of the charts. Um, not because they're not great games. I have both of them and I love them, but because I want to see new games getting it there. You know, I want to see a Fae jump up to the top there. I want to see Mulaka get up there. You know, I want to see brand new experiences. You know, I'm ha one thing I am happy about seeing is Golf Story. That's that's a, you know, a shining light in this fa in this mist of re-releases and old games. You know, Golf Story exclusive to Switch, brand new game being on the top of the charts again after that sale. I'm loving seeing that, but we need to see more games like that. So Anyway, that's, uh, that's that segment of Hot Matches. This next segment I like to call the No Filter Rant, where I pick a topic and I pretty much rant at you guys for a solid 20 or so minutes. <laughs> anyway, let's get going here. The Metroid fanbase is the most toxic fanbase in all of gaming. That's a very tough seat to fill, but you know what, I feel like the Zelda fanbase can maybe uh, leave the throne for a little bit here and give that to the Metroid fanbase because uh, they have me worried, you know, with Metroid Prime 4 coming out um, and looking at the past Metroid games that have been announced and released and the fan reactions to a lot of these things, the fans are toxic, you know. Um, I, I believe, I strongly believe the Metroid fanbase is one of the main reasons why the Metroid series hasn't grown into something bigger and more of a no pun intended, prime series for Nintendo to focus on and uh, really develop into something like a Zelda or a Mario or an Animal Crossing or Mario Kart, anything like that, you know? So let's go over a history of Metroid and see how the Metroid fanbase has reacted. So the first Metroid was released along with Metroid 2 Return of Samus. I don't believe it really had the crazy cult following, um, uh, you know, by that time. However, following Metroid 2 Samus, uh, Return of Samus on the Game Boy, Super Metroid came out, and I believe that is when the fans truly came out in droves, you know, and for good reason. Super Metroid is a fantastic game, and the game's held up on this pedestal. Well, yes, it is deserved. Um, it does not negate every other game that comes out that they shouldn't be different than that. You know, the Metroid franchise, the series needs to develop and grow. And just because Super Metroid is a fantastic game in itself, the series needs to develop. And I think that's one of the main issues with the Metroid fan base is that they hold everything to not just the standard of Super Metroid, but everything to these conventions, the premise that they made in that one game to dictate the rest of the series going forward. Um, that is usually something that is a terrible thing for a series and means that that series will not grow and develop. Look at a game like Call of Duty. After Call of Duty Modern Warfare, uh, Modern Warfare, those games have stuck to that same formula for so long and look at the hate that that, those series, uh, that game series gets now. You know, even with a game like World War II that was received pretty well, I think that's mainly because of how poorly the previous games were taken and because it went back to its roots almost as if it was a remake. And hold that thought about it being a remake. I'm going to get back to that point later on. Next game you had was Metroid Fusion, which I believe was received pretty well. I feel like some people still didn't like some of the changes, some smaller things, but I think that was more typical, um, just fan base kind of bickering that you'd see in almost any series. But after Metroid Fusion, uh, quite quickly after Metroid Fusion, was Metroid Prime, which was the biggie. So this was the one where you're converting a 2D side-scrolling uh, action-adventure game of Metroid 
to a 3D action adventure first person shooter game, which is uh, kind of insane when you think about it. Uh, you know, back in the day, switching anything from 2D to 3D, as you saw with, uh, say, Mario 64, this is a biggie, and giving it to an unknown developer at Retro Studios, this was something big. And I remember there's a ton of backlash at the start for this. Thankfully, over time, people came to understand, it might not have been as long as some of the other games, but people come to understand that Metroid Prime is a fucking awesome game. And uh, and so that's that's good to see. This one wasn't as crazy as it could have been with Metroid fans, but um, I think it's just a testament to how fantastic Metroid Prime was and how revolutionary it was on the GameCube. So uh, Metroid Prime 2 Echoes came out. Uh, a little bit of uh, trepidation, I guess, against that, but I think it was still pretty uh, positively received. Metroid Zero Mission, Metroid Prime Pinball, Metroid Prime Hunters, and Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. So this is probably the, the heyday of the Metroid series. You know, all of these games coming out, um, you know, within, I believe, five or six years of each other. And, uh, you know, a lot of fantastic games there. A remake of the original Metroid, Metroid Zero Mission, which is really cool to see. Um, a spin-off in Pinball, which, you know, because you have so many other games coming out, wasn't as much of a concern. Metroid Prime Hunters, which did receive some backlash, I think. But uh, I don't remember too much about that. And Metroid Prime 3 Corruption, which received some backlash as well. Uh, but mainly because some of the changes throughout the game, which I feel like are needed in a series that is long-running, like the Metroid Prime series was. And, uh, and this is kind of going to lead into what I want to talk about with Metroid Prime 4, but let's get on to that uh, later on here as well. Let's talk about this first game, Metroid Prime Trilogy. That game came out on the Wii. Uh, fantastic. The three games for the one sixty dollars price with, uh, actually I believe it was $50 on the Wii back then, which is insane. Comes with the collector's uh, steelbook case with the art book, everything. This was incredible and perfect for a series like this. But the other Wii game comes out, Metroid Other M. Disclaimer, people. This game is fucking good. It is a good game. In my opinion, a great game. One of the best games on the Wii. Seriously. And I, I know it's subjective, but anyone who says otherwise, you're fucking dumb. <laughs> no, but seriously, though, this game is fucking good. People complain, people want to complain, they just want to push, and this is where the Metroid fanbase really gets fucking terrible. What they go about here is because it's this change, it switches up things a little bit here, all of a sudden now, oh, the story is fucking awful, I hate this game. Since fucking when has the Metroid Prime series ever had a story that people actually really give a fuck about? They care about the characters, which it had in there, and that's pretty much it. I get that some people didn't like how uh, how Samus uh, was kind of acting around Adam and all that kind of stuff, but this is a fucking Metroid game, people. That didn't. It's not like that was complete blasphemy. It kind of corresponds to some of her character in the previous games, but the actual game, the gameplay, is fucking fun and innovative. People needed to fucking calm down with this because this is the main reason why the metroid series was not revisited again for many many years and that's because of the metroid fan base this switched things up this changed things made it better gameplay wise in my opinion than the 2d metroids and it had the innovation with the uh you know going to first person view for puzzle solving aspects but now it has the stigma of being a terrible metroid game everyone wants to piggyback onto that and that's just something people say without actually thinking about the game or anyway that is where the metroid fan base really kind of jumped everywhere and just kind of went crazy so after that there is a long long hiatus this is where i think nintendo kind of had a bad uh had a bad go here i think they were kind of in a bad situation with the wii u and the 3ds anyway with the 3ds doing really well and the wii u doing very poorly but they did come out with metroid prime federation force yeah <laughs> it's definitely a bit tone deaf on nintendo's part you know the complete change after the hiatus was not a great idea uh, you know putting it on 3ds when everyone wants the next big metroid game that's a little odd having a multiplayer centric people are expecting a, more of a return to form that would have been great for a hmm, maybe a remake or something eh, we'll, we'll see that might have been good for something like that, but no, they don't get that. And I think the big killer was them announcing it with Blast Ball. First off, you have these chibi-looking things that don't look like it, so I get Metroid fans not liking it, but then they announce it with Blast Ball, don't give the name. 
It was terrible, terrible marketing, and hopefully Nintendo's learned from it. The game itself, though, was not bad. And this is, again, where the Metroid fans just blatantly don't even look at what the game is. If it's different than Super Metroid or the Metroid Prime that they know, Metroid Prime 3 is a little bit different because it holds the Prime name, but people also didn't like it because they went to different worlds, they had Marines, it wasn't you shipwrecked on a planet or whatever it is. This is where the Metroid fans didn't care about it being a good game, they cared about it being a game like Super Metroid or the original Metroid Prime. This is where they are super toxic and they will never let the game series grow. Again, not judging the game on its merits, from a from a renowned developer too, Next Level Games. The game was not bad, people. It was a good game. I enjoyed it. Anyway, kind of what I was bringing up with Metroid Prime, Federation Force, how it was bad timing. After a long hiatus like that, what would have been perfect, a remake. That's what would have been a good thing to reintroduce the Metroid series to the fans, and that's what they did with Metroid Samus Returns. Again, there was some hate at the start because of the developer, but that has nothing to do with Metroid. Um... But yeah, I remember people trying to shit on it, you know, whatever it is. There are people trying to say, hey, this isn't Super Metroid. Super Metroid's much better than this. Fuck off with the nostalgia glasses, people. Seriously, I get it is entirely subjective. But here's an example. I played Metroid Samus Returns bef before I played Super Metroid. I played Super Metroid on my Nintendo, uh, new Nintendo 3DS after I played Metroid Samus Returns on the 3DS. And I enjoyed Samus Returns more. That's just what it is. This is from a person who did not play Super Metroid beforehand. I did like the art from Super Metroid more, but the actual game, how it was put it together, I, in my opinion, Samus Returns is better. So trying to say that just writing off Samus Returns as a nothing because it's not Super Metroid is stupid. And I know it's not everybody doing that, but... And, and there's actually quite a lot of Metroid fans that are backing and really liked Samus Returns, but there are still some out there, and that's the toxicity that I hope doesn't drag over into Metroid Prime 4. So this part isn't based on facts, there is no sources here, but it feels like a lot of Metroid fans don't actually buy the games. You know, the series itself has not performed as well as it seems to with the vocal minority. And I do feel like a lot of Metroid fans are not buying the new games as clear with Met Federation Force for sure, even yes with Samus Returns, they do not buy the games if it's not the original Super Metroid or anything like that, you know? And that is a terrible thing to see because, again, that is another thing that money talks, and if the games aren't selling, changes to Metroid aren't going to happen. They will re release, they will re release. Maybe they'll make a game that really tries to cater to this vocal minority, this toxic fan base, but that's not a good thing to do. That'll hold back the whole series and not make it anything better or bigger than it already was. But yeah, getting to Metroid Prime 4. When Metroid Prime 4 comes out, it is going to be something unique. It is going to be something special. It will be different than the Metroid Prime Trilogy. It is not from the same developer. I'm sure they have some sort of discussion about where they thought they would go with the series. But it's not from the same developers. It will not be the same as Metroid Prime Trilogy. And it shouldn't be. Those games can stay by themselves as classics, whatever you want to call them. But leave those as they are and let let Metroid Prime 4 have a chance. It needs to do something different. And how I feel is these nostalgic little crybabies are freaking out whenever there is a change. You guys, are, you know, this can't happen for Metroid Prime 4. Metroid Prime 4 needs to be something new. And who knows, maybe with Metroid Prime 4, they're going to try to bring in a new audience, maybe have multiplayer included, you know, make this a new trilogy. Who knows? But they need to... They need to have a fair shot here. This is not meant to be the same as Metroid Prime 1, and it won't be, and it shouldn't be, and I hope to God it isn't. It needs to be something new, something different, but with the Metroid Prime name, and likely as a first-person adventure game. There's lots of new things they can do with the Switch, with, with new hardware. You guys are the bane to gaming if this is how you're really feeling and this is how you're pushing the Metroid Prime series, and this is a reason why games like Call of Duty do so well, so... Fuck off. <laughs> Anyways, guys, those are my thoughts about the uh, the Metroid, just the Metroid fans in general and how toxic they are. And really, this can be applied to a ton of people in Nintendo game communities like Zelda, like Mario. Um, you know, a lot of games like this 
can you know and their fans can be kind of incorporated something like this but i really do feel like metroid is getting hindered so badly by its fans that this needs to change and this needs to stop so i hope you guys enjoyed this video leave comments let me know what you guys think about this am i going a little bit too doom and gloom here or is this uh you think i'm a little bit sound with my arguments here so please let me know and i will see you guys next time